So um, maybe what we can do, we can start with a quick round of introductions. So we hear from our panelists on what they do, uh, especially in the realm of AI. And then I have some questions for them that uh, allows us to, to participate in a good discourse. So maybe we can start from that end of the panel and start with Rizwan. Sure, thanks, Sane. Uh, Rizwan Kalpan, I'm the Chief Digital and Payments Officer at uh, TD Bank. It's a North American bank, and I've been privileged to lead the digital transformation for the last uh, 10 years, and looking forward to the AI first uh, approach at TD. Mark. And uh, I'm Mark Greaves. I currently run the AI and advanced computing philanthropy uh, for Eric Schmidt. And this is Schmidt Sciences, um, a major philanthropy by Eric and Wendy Schmidt. Anna? I'm Anna Kozlowskis, co-founder and CEO of Vana. Um, we build tools for users to contribute their data to models that they jointly own and govern. So think a user-owned foundation model created by 100 million people who contribute their data in a privacy-preserving way and earn as it's used. Uh, I'm Stuart Davis. I work for the South Australian government and oversee our AI and health hub program. Um, so our, our healthcare costs are raising at 4% a, a year and our tax base isn't so, so we've got a train crash coming. So we're looking to lead a transition to preventative and, and a wellness-focused healthcare system using AI. Amazing. Thank you very much. So maybe, Mark, we start with you. You are working on a very interesting initiative. I have had the opportunity to collaborate with some of your team members. And what's very unique about this program, it is that it's focusing on some of the key fundamental issues that is surrounding the AI ecosystem and what we need to solve for the next 20, 30 years. Tell us a little bit more about that and tell us about some of those challenges and how we are overcoming them. I will. So, and so, first of all, thank you so much for uh, uh, allowing me on this panel. Um, it's, it's from moonshot to application, and so you have to start with a moonshot. moonshot yeah. And uh, that is actually the role of philanthropy. Or one of the things we do is try and put the smartest people, the hardest problems, and the most risk together to try and make uh, make progress. And so, if you think of smart people and hard problems. That's the key to this program, uh, which we are running uh, with Hussein, uh, called um, AI 2050. And so the, 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 the key question here, or the key framing question, is, OK, it's 2050. It's uh, 26 years from now. What, and, and AI has turned out to be hugely beneficial. So what happened? Right? What did we have to start working on now to get right? And so AI 2050 is all about that question. And so one of the interesting things that we had to think about when we wanted to address that is um, how do we structure a moonshot, right? How do you actually build one? And so we came up with a couple of principles. Uh, very briefly, one principle is we wanted to get the very smartest people on this. And uh, so we, have, uh, we primarily fund uh, uh, young faculty in uh, universities all around the world. We have a complex nomination process to get to them. Um, and we give them relatively unrestricted funds because we can't really predict how this might work out. So we want the smart people to follow the rabbit, not us to, to prescribe what they do. Um, but the second thing we have to do is inspire them. Right? Because the smartest people can work on lots of problems. So how do you inspire them? And, this, and the way we did that was building this question about how we get to 2050 and focusing on the benefits of AI, not the, really the risks so much, but really how can AI help us? And that turns out to be enormously inspiring. And the second thing we do is uh, we don't just ask them to be free around what they might get, but we ask them to put their projects or their work into categories. And these are categories around what kinds of problems you might have to solve. And so one category is, I think, fairly technical. You know, is how do you get AI to be more capable, more general, more trustworthy, solve the hallucination problem, solve the robustness problem, hit some of the safety problems where the AIs just generate crap. You know, just try and get all this stuff, which can be fairly technical in there. And we have a group of people who are really inspired by that. But the second thing is, how do we think about AI and the great challenges of our time? the science challenges, the engineering and design challenges, the education challenges. 
you know, how do we, how do we sort of apply AI in these domains and how do we think about that? And, it, and, it, and, um, and I'll also put into there um, uh, what I'll call the economic and access challenges. Right now, a lot of AI is controlled by a fairly small number of companies, primarily on the United States West Coast. Mm -hmm. That's not really sustainable, right? So how do we think about access and participation in the growth of AI? This turns out to be enormously inspiring for sets of people. And then how do we think about deploying it responsibly in society? We have a lot of societies in this world. And if we want AI to spread across the world, how do we think about all of that? How do we think about the fact that in Morocco, it is uh, against the law to criticize the king. In the United States, it is expected to criticize the president. How do we think about that and how do you build AIs that work in different societal contexts in the different ways that people have chosen to organize themselves? And, and kind of finally, I think about social systems. We're a very pluralistic world. In this, in this country, we're very pluralistic societies in the West. How do we think about governance? How do we think about how governments can use AI and bring them to their citizens, right? So that their citizens grow up to be really first class participants in the world, aided by this technology that's as revolutionary as electricity. So that's how we think about it. Those are the problems we're trying to work on. Happy to talk to anybody afterwards. Thank you so much. I'm sure we have lots of faculty members who want to come and talk to you. Yes. Um, Anna, maybe we come to you next. Um, in our conversation, I was very inspired because one thing that you know really stood out was how you emphasize on data, data strategy, and the, the centrality of the data and its ownership. Uh, and you consider it even more important than AI itself. So tell us a little bit more about that, your view, and what is your vision for, um, for Vanna? Yeah, so I think with all of these AI models, ultimately they are just a product of the data that they've learned from, right? You can think of them almost as just like a being that learns from the data that it reads. And today it's mostly the public internet, right? So it's just sort of watching all the YouTube videos, reading Reddit, et cetera. But what you really want is very high quality data to teach these models to make them much better. And so how do you create incentive structures such that um, everyone can help to teach the AI and contribute their data towards it. I think one really important point here is decentralization. Um, because if you imagine a world where just one company is trying to determine what truth is and figure out, hey, what is the right answer to this question, it's kind of an impossible question, right? Like everyone has a different perspective and how do you make sure that AI actually represents many different people. Um, it's that you have a decentralized AI ecosystem with many different AIs that represent many different people. Um, decentralization specifically, I, I got interested in because I was obsessed with central banks. Like I had a picture of Janet Yellen hanging in my high school bedroom, <laughs> um, just ob obsessed. Um, and then came to MIT, learned about uh, decentralized central banks and started mining Ethereum here. And so with Vana, what we're doing is applying those same tools of decentralization that have really worked for currency, like Bitcoin and Ethereum, to AI and data, right? How do you put that power in the hands of the people and ensure that it remains um, decentralized and, and well distributed? That's amazing. I'm sure that you and Rizwan will have a lot to come and to discuss. So Rizwan, as a segue, maybe you, we come to you and uh, of course, we have had an opportunity to collaborate together for years. And one thing that stands out for TD and its public knowledge that it has been the bank that is always in the forefront of digital and data innovation. It became the number one personalized bank, you know, globally. So tell us a little bit more about that. I mean, you are working for a complex bank and which is regulated, but you continue to bring innovation to the market, both in terms of your AI and data strategy. What are the lessons learned and perhaps what are some of the things that you know, our, our um, attendees can have as takeaways? Yeah, thanks. I mean, uh, you come to this place and you always learn something new. I learned a young person could have uh, a central banker as a role model. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, I, I've been privileged to kind of lead uh, the digital transformation. In every 15 years, you have a disruptive technology that impacts society, cross industry, each of us, changes our behaviors, our preferences, our expectations. The last time that happened was the smartphone. 
and it changed our lives. And you know, when I reflect back on the lessons, you know, I think you know, a lot of the lessons there could be applied going forward as we embrace the new uh, wave of AI. Uh, Mark talked about talent. You know, so think about a bank trying to attract the best AI scientists. That's a difficult proposition, but we have to do that. You have three choices. You, know, you can do it through acquisition, which is what we did at TD. We acquired a leading uh, predictive AI uh, you know, uh, startup, and that startup within the bank has now grown 5x you know, as far as talent is concerned. Yeah, you can obviously do it organically, which for an incumbent organization, it's really tough to do. Uh, and, or you can actually partner with uh, you know, the industry. But you gotta make choices here. Uh, so talent is gonna be key. The second thing is you need an operating model. So if I reflect back on the mobile transformation, you know, we embraced agile, agile at scale. Created pods, cross-functional teams coming together. So what is the operating model going forward where you can infuse AI mindset in everything we do, you know, uh, from facing our customers to the back office operations technology. The third thing, you know, I would say is, you know, the right architecture. So on the mobile side, you know, we worked very closely with, uh, you know, startups like uh, Flybits to abstract our legacy environment and create new innovations in the front end, you know, customer and colleague facing uh, experiences or capabilities. Uh, when it comes to personalization, when it comes to basically serving the holistic needs of our customers. And so, you know, in this context, what is the right architecture for an AI-first organization? The way we think about it is a platform. I hear a lot about, you know, different components of the platform. We hear about data, which is super important. Obviously, the value of data has exponentially increased, both within the firewall and outside the firewall. But people talk about data separate from compute, separate from models, you know, and middleware and uh, application layer. We're thinking about a platform that kind of brings all these components together that can scale, has a resiliency, because a lot is gonna change. We are just in the nascent phase of this transformation. And so having the right architecture is important. Delivering capability is one thing, at least for us. You know, our mission is to enrich the lives of our customers, our colleagues, and in our communities. And, you know, it's not a capability game, it's about delivering experiences. So we double down on human-centered design. And so it'll be interesting to see how human-centered design evolves in an AI world. Because you know, previously, it was a lot more about visual design, making it easy, intuitive, fast. Uh, but now it's gonna be about taking personalization and engagement to a whole new level. And then finally, you, know, uh, you need a mature innovation ecosystem because you want to be able to kind of have your own colleagues involved. So from colleague ideation, incubation, acceleration, all the way to partnerships with startups, fintechs, uh, you know, uh, to having a patent portfolio, you need to have an ecosystem, innovation ecosystem that's robust, that's kind of, be, you know, can embrace this change in a way that the organization can uh, uh, truly take advantage of it. I say the things that, you know, early learnings right now, mobile, you know, it took years. For us to get the first million customers, the first 10 million customers, it took years. What we're seeing with this new wave of AI, it's moving so fast. So speed is gonna be a challenge for a large organization to navigate through. Uh, I'd say the, you know, the, the, a double down on uh, you know, the comments around data. The data ecosystems that are being, uh, are being formed are critical. It was a lot about harnessing the power of data within the, your firewall. Now it's about connecting data to different ecosystems, potentially across industry. And how do you ensure that you're, you know, as you're actually leveraging this data, you do it in a way where you maintain the trust with our customers. Trust is the fundamental relationship we have with our customers. And as we pursue uh, AI first mindset, we want to not only maintain the trust, but enhance the trust. That's how we are thinking about taking the learnings and applying it going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rizwan. Uh, Stuart, you're working on a global problem, which I think exists all around the world, which is what's the future of healthcare and where can digital and especially AI can come and that intersection may, may help us to really manage our healthcare systems better from patient experience, to drug discovery, to access to healthcare, to access to, to specialists. 
Um, your initiative in Australia is pretty unique. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and what can we learn from that? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Thank you. Um, there are some really interesting synergies with what's been discussed so far, so um, some really nice parallels. Um, so, so our ambition is to drive a, a system that's focused on prevention and, and wellness. Um, as a state, you know, we've got a public health care system um, and have data sets that are quite unique. So we're the only state in Australia with a um, statewide electronic medical record, other states are hospital by hospital. Um, we also have genomic samples um, that, that are really valuable. Um, South Australia is quite isolated, so we're quite unique in the value of those, those data assets. But then they're held by the state as well. So there, there's a responsibility to the community, the health consumer and the patient in terms of how they're, they're realised and driven to um, unlock the value. Um, that, that, that value needs to come from partnerships with the industry, research, and the health organisations themselves. So how do you have an organisational structure that, that allows that? How do you ensure that it's patient-driven? And so health consumers are in the conversation the entire way along um, to guide the solution. And um, those conversations are had with really clear language, easy to understand, and um, are, are structured in a way where you're not having preconceived ideas about security or what AI is or the, the risks, and so they're not getting in the way. Um, but then what's the architecture that allows that? So if you've got a public healthcare system that's allowing data to be passed to a private industry organisation to drive profits, then the community's not going to stand for it. Um, so if, if you've got a structure that allows um, a, a trusted um, execution environment within the healthcare system itself, where they're controlling governance, access and, and ethics, and you're just passing the insight and the value that goes back to those in organisations to understand disease, validate models and develop new drugs, then there's a way there where all of these pieces can fit together in, in a way that can transform healthcare. That's amazing, yeah. So I will share my takeaways from your, uh, from your great uh, comments, and then I have some specific questions for you, and we want to keep everyone on time uh, for the rest of the program. I think the key takeaways from your uh, comments is that we need to have a, 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 an, an, eco an ecology understanding of AI and really come up with a framework allowing us to really looking at it as what really came from the defense system, system of systems. They all need to come together in a coherent ecology, whether it's governance, data sharing, ethics, transparency. I personally do not believe in explainability in AI, because if you know how many of these networks work, it's very difficult to explain how they work. You can audit them. You can bring more transparency and associate risks but it's very difficult to explain exactly how a decision is being made. So that's why I would say auditability and transparency. Um, and I think if there are frameworks like amazing initiatives like you that really allows great minds in the world to collaborate and think about them, we will have a framework in which we can really build that trust medium. My view is, I remember go back 20, 25 years ago, it was unfathomable that we could have multi-point HD video conferencing from point to points in the world. We now take it for granted. So I think we have created a very powerful communications medium around the world, but now we need to go and build a transactional and a trust medium on top of that. And kind of removing the technical jargons, whether it's edge computing or decentralization or blockchain or AI, these can all come very nicely together to form that uh, trust medium, and AI will be a key component of that. I think my takeaway from you, Rizwan, is I remember like 2008 when Steve Jobs announced um, the Apple Store. Um, it really created an ecosystem, but I could be an entrepreneur with an iPhone and an SDK in my basement. I could build a game or an app, and I could make millions of dollars. But if I'm an AI entrepreneur right now, I can do it, I can build an algorithm, but without data, I don't have anything. And you have no idea, I have an opportunity to co-teach a course here with uh, Ramesh that you will hear from later today called AI Venture Studio. You have no idea how many frustrated entrepreneurs we meet that they're like, I have this amazing thing, but no one gives me the data. Well, of course, they should not give you the data because you also need to understand the portability, the privacy, the contracts, similar to, to, to what you mentioned. 
And I think that's really key that you highlighted, that decentralization doesn't mean Bitcoin. Decentralization can do so many things with the ownership of data and create confidence and comfort for people to share in exchange of value. And going back to governance, I want to have a kill switch. I want to delink my data. I want to see how my data is training these models. And I think another thing that I think is the convergence of your talks, like you mentioned genomics. Hmm. We have a program that is building an intergenerational health network using genome data to connect people in their 20s to people in their you know, later stages of their life to learn from each other. What are the things I did? What are the nutritional things that I did? Now, imagine what data we are using. Perhaps one of the most sensitive, critical data that you can ever access. But if you can use that and keep it encrypted, local, on a chipset that you can own, then you can unlock a lot of interesting things uh, in, in the healthcare industry. So maybe um, I, I go back to, to, to Mark. Uh, of all the things that you're seeing, what do you think is going to be one of the key impediments that if we solve, suddenly, you know, we can unleash the impact of AI on a, on a societal way. I mean, you're working, you're the, the associated programs that you have are really addressing key challenges. But if you can pick one and say, if we solve this, we are gonna have a big leap, what could that be? Oh, gee, <laughs> you know, which one of my babies is the prettiest? <laughs> uh, I, I, maybe I will pick two. Sure, okay, yeah. So, <laughs> so one is um, we, AI, Actually, there was a wonderful uh, editorial in the New York Times about this uh, just a couple of days ago. AI is currently almost unmeasurable, right? If you think of it, AI as a science instrument, it is uncalibrated. So how do we deal with that? How do you think, this, this weaves into these ideas of trust, of how we think about what uh, conclusions are that it comes to, what kinds of systems we put it into. It all rolls down to what are the right metrics for AI and how do we trust them? This is not a solved problem. There are some people who are thinking about it. There's a lot of ideas out there. We're funding a lot of great work in there. But how you actually measure AI, what are the quantities of interest, right? And how you get better and better along some kind of trajectory, that turns out to be an incredible, uh, I think, technical issue. I think the, 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 the main uh, other impediment, I'll say, is a socio-technical one. We all know that AI is going to change employment, it's going to change relationships, it's going to change uh, the nature of work. How do we think about that and how do we manage that transition so that at the end of the day, we have a marvelously uh, beneficial technology in society and while we're in the transition, because AI is, is not going to be evenly distributed, right? And so while we're in the middle, how do we ensure that we uh, uh, are continuously providing the benefits of AI as broadly as possible? And so we think a lot about AI and economics. We have some wonderful work in there. Um, gathering data, it's still early days, but hopefully uh, uh, we'll be able, our grantees, will be able to provide the information that everybody else here on this panel needs, you know, to wisely guide AI. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So human AI systems, you can yeah. always use AI to build decision making systems, but yeah. we can also use AI to build decision support systems. Yeah. So we will make the final decision, but we can have the ability to consult personalized models and large models to, to make decisions. Very quickly, Riz, you know, when you think about kind of what AI is doing to change industries, like after the Industrial Revolution, we divided industries into sectors. You're in finance, and you're in healthcare, and you're in retail. What is the future of a financial institution? Is it continuing to be an organization that just manages our money, or it can become a trust hub to connect us to essentially our living a better life? Look, I mean, uh, you know, when you look at uh, Americans, you know, the financial fluency continues to be uh, really low. And uh, even though we've got, you know, we put the bank in everybody's pocket through a mobile device, you know, people are not that interested in banking. <laughs> They're not. Who wakes up in the morning and says, gee, I really feel like a credit card or I really feel like a mortgage. No, you say, I feel like going on a vacation or I want to, you know, renovate my uh, family home, right? It's about lives. 
And I think the opportunity here is that, you know, we're gonna harness the power of data to understand people's lives, their objectives, their goals, their aspirations. The advantage that we have, at least at our bank, is we, you know, as I mentioned, our relationship with our customers is fundamentally based on trust. And so if we can harness the power of data across their lives and be able to you know, maintain, if not enhance their trust, we'll be able to you know, serve them more holistically. That's huge opportunity. That's effectively, you know, how do you, like, you know, more recently, I'll tell you that uh, we're just launching, you know, as an example, serving small business customers. Today, small business customers running, you know, uh, a, uh, a restaurant or a cafe, they've got to deal with disjointed experiences. Banking is different from payments. It's different from invoicing. It's different from uh, taxation. It's different from ARPR, payroll, etc. We just we are in the process of launching, you know, an integrated, you know, solution where all of these come together, and it makes their lives easier. Why? So they can focus on what's important to them, running their business. I see, you know, the next wave of AI giving us an opportunity, regardless of what the customer is: retail, wealth, insurance, small business, mid-size, commercial, institutional, for banks to be able to collect this data maintain this trust, and then serve customers more holistically. Hopefully you can do some of that with Flybit. <laughs> with Flybit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so very quickly, I have been given the notice. Uh, tell us about your vision for Vano. It's a fascinating thing. I read the website. You know, what's next? Yeah, I, I think um, in the theme of moonshots, like if you think far out and you have a perfect almost AI clone of yourself that you can deploy autonomously, right? There are 10 AI Annas. They're like out there working in the world, producing economic value, collaborating with others. How do you make sure that like I'm the one who owns AI Anna, right? Or you're the one who owns the AI version of yourself? Um, because as we start to see like huge economic shifts that are created by AI, right, where there's actually a lot of displacement of labor, et cetera, having you be the one who owns the AI that gets created from your data ensures that, I, I don't know, a big company doesn't take your data, train an AI, and kind of replace you with it. Um, and so the big vision is really making sure that we have this healthy, decentralized ecology of AI models where people are in control and, and benefit from the technology um, rather than it being too concentrated. Thank you. Stuart, you're one of our greatest collaborators at the MIT Connection Science. Uh, we would love to have you here again next year. And if you think about next year, what should we expect? What do you want to do with this, this great initiative that you have in Australia? In, in terms of where I'd like to be yeah. next year? I think the, the, the critical piece with such a, a grand moonshot is, is where do you start? So if we could be within 12 months to have uh, an end-to-end -end slither that demonstrates benefit, that improves health outcomes within one domain, um, say diabetes, for example, that's driven by the consumers in that space and is making a change to the world, then that's one step that then you can build on. Brilliant. So thank you very much for joining our panel and visiting us at the Media Lab. Uh, you have a great day ahead of you and we are all looking forward to stay connected. Thank you. <laughs>